plan this too well. Let's sing it all in a row. It's not gonna happen. I'm still gonna preach, it'll be fine. Turn with me to Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse uh, chapter, uh, chapter five, verse sixteen. We've been talking a lot about law and grace and freedom and uh, chains. And, uh, we're getting to the we're getting to the stuff now that applies. As Paul is writing this to the Galatian people, he is he is this is application. You see. We may be free from the law. We may be free from sin and death. But boy, it sure don't feel like it, does it? <laughs> sometimes it's just, uh, you know, sometimes you feel like the compulsion of sin is louder than and stronger than God's gentle prodding to do what's right. And that there is a real raging battle within our hearts. And more often than we care to admit, the wrong side wins. Did that hurt? Did y'all hurt in there? Y'all feel like that? Yeah. Or is it just me? <laughs> but there is a battle that wages. And the question is this. How do you win the battle against our compulsion to sin? How do you conquer this Christ, this, uh, this sinful nature that is in within all of us? How do you come, how do you get over the perversions that are of the flesh? Well, in Galatians five or sixteen, gives us a pretty surprising answer. It says, "I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh." Notice something. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh if you walk in the Spirit. For if you do, then literally walk, it means walk by the Spirit or step by step, moment by moment in life, depend upon the Spirit of God. For if you do, you will by no means and in no way gratify the desires of the flesh. That's the answer, guys. That's it. And here's the surprise. You overcome our desire to sin not through your own willpower or your own self-effort. No, that's not the way it works. You overcome your sin, your desire to sin, through a moment-to-moment -moment dependence upon the Spirit of God. You cannot win this battle, this war by your own human spirit. Your own human willpower. And so we need to live by the Holy Spirit. Is the first part of this and you must depend on His power. You can't do it on your own. You must rely on the Spirit of God. And then and only then will you be able to conquer the desires of the flesh. Look at verse 17. For the flesh lust against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do, so that you do not do the things that you wish. <laughs> Lots of do nots and, and stuff in there, but basically what I'm saying, the flesh and the spirit are incompatible. There is an internal conflict going on within every believer and that your sinful nature and the Holy Spirit are at war all the time. Those who are most confident about their self-control and their willpower are the most likely to give in to temptation. Did you hear that? If you're proud of, of your self-control and your willpower and you can do things on your own, you're going to be one of the first ones to fall temptation. So don't put your confidence in yourself. Put it on the strength of the Holy Spirit. Then, and only then, will you conquer the desires of the flesh. Or as verse 16 puts, no ways, no means, you'll be able to gratify the, the flesh. So every moment, you're going to have to walk 
and live by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that's not a one-time event. That's every day, every moment. You're walk, you're being led. You're, you're living by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me give you an example of kind of something that won't terribly bring me some ill no path. All right. Now, as long as my hand is under this book, gravity cannot take this book, you know, cannot uh, make this book fall. Now, that's not to say that gravity is no longer present. It certainly is. It's just that the muscular force of my hand and, uh, and my arm is stronger than the force of gravity. In the same way, the Holy Spirit is stronger than our sinful nature. It's always present. That sinful nature is always present and always trying to pull us down. But as long as we depend on the Holy Spirit to hold us up, then our sinful nature cannot pull us down. It's only when we try to live independent of the power of the Holy Spirit. What happened? Well, it failed because it could not hold itself up. Our sin nature cannot hold our... Our sin nature, we can't hold it up. Only the Spirit of God can keep it from falling. Our self-effort will cause us to sin. And we end up doing the exact same thing that we, did, we said we weren't going to do. I don't know how many people that I know have known over the last five years, Terry, and you know it. They tried to, they tried to solve their problems in life on their own. I got this. There's some people in here who said that before. I, I got this. I can do this on my own. It doesn't work that way. Almost in everything, they fall and they fail. Because they didn't have the strength to hold themselves up. In Pilgrim's Process of Progress, I don't know if y'all ever read that or not, a man goes into an interpreter's house, finds a large room where dust covers everything, and as they're seated in that room, a girl comes in with a broom, and she starts sweeping. <coughs> have y'all have y'all ever went into, a, I mean, a house that was extremely dirty, the floors were dirty, and you started sweeping? What did it do? <laughs> all you did was stir it up. <laughs> That's all you've done. Is stirred up. And that's what happens when we, in our strength and by our own willpower, try to clean up our own lives. All we do is stir up the dust of sin, which leaves everybody gagging and coughing. There is a better way. And that's the way of the Spirit. And when you depend on the Holy Spirit's power, you conquer the cravings of the flesh. And when you live by the Spirit, you by no means and in no way gratify the desires of the flesh. Do it His way. There is a way to cling, by the way. A right way and a wrong way. And because of my wife, I am totally ruined as a man. I might as well turn my man card in because I know how to cling. Because she taught me. She taught me that it doesn't do any good to sweep the floor even though I don't always provide it. To sweep the floor and then dust everything on the floor. All you're doing is messy. So there is a way. The right way. A way that works. And it's not our way. But it is God's way. So if you want to win the battle against your compulsion to sin, then you must live by the Spirit and so conquer the desires of the flesh. And more than that, you must be allowed to be led by the flesh. I mean by the Spirit. You've got to be led by the Spirit. You must follow... Holy Spirit's direction. Listen to His voice. Conquer the deeds. And look at verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. We're getting back to the law again, huh? He's putting this all together. Those who follow the Spirit have a better way of living than those who try to follow the law. You see, like that room, that like that room in Pilgrim's Progress, which only stirs up the dust the sin in our lives, the law actually causes us, or stimulates us to sin. It doesn't scrub the sin away. All you're doing is moving it to a different corner. 
And many of you know exactly when you were kids, when you were told to clean up your room, where everything went. Under the bed. Did you clean your room? No. You just hid the stuff. And that's what we do under the law. We're just stirring it all up, moving things around. But it doesn't actually clean anything. But we do not have to live under the law anymore. Now we can be led by the Spirit. Follow His direction. Before I married Miss Terry here, I was pretty much helpless in the kitchen. I don't have any, I could open a can of beans, I could eat some stuff in a, in a you know, microwave, you know, pretty, not pretty good in a microwave. But as far as sitting down and actually making something, and I'll never, I'll never forget the first few times that I tried to get something off the internet and I was going to make something. And I had very little experience it, and I was trying to follow the directions. But what I found was I thought I, as much as I tried to follow the best I could, but the end result never was good. But then she would come in and show me the tricks of the trade, how, how to do this. Well, how much is this? how much you put in there? She ordered like that. <laughs> yeah, she would show me, and I, I've heard, and I, I, I'm still learning. She's still te trying to teach me. But I could not just go by the directions. It didn't explain to me the intricacies of cooking. It, it was just, bump, bump, do this, 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 and this, and there. It don't work that way. It never has. Now, I had to have someone to guide me through the process. Now, I did all the stuff. But she was always watching over and making sure I didn't I did it right. <laughs> Making guiding me through the process. Now that's exactly what a, the believer has in the Holy Spirit. We, we know Christ is no longer it's no longer confined to law, that we're a list of do's and don'ts. We're under a better system. And the Holy Spirit is to guide us through this life of living a holy life. And all we have to do is listen to him. There is nothing more frustrating than to try to tell somebody how you do this. And they say, I got a better way. <laughs> I, I got a better way. And you watch them just constantly you know, make, make a mistake because they wouldn't listen. But isn't that what the Spirit of God does to us? Doesn't he guide us and we say, no, 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 I got a better way. I got a way that this will work. This will work here. And it doesn't. But if you insist on doing it yourself, if you insist on trying to follow the rules about the power of God and the Holy Spirit, then you will violate every, every rule in the book. You see, because the flesh knows no law. The flesh knows no law. Let's look at verse 19. 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery. This is the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries. Uh, is there another? No, we're getting 21. No, that's it. Yeah. All of those things are works of the flesh. Uh, if you look at that list pretty close, you may not like it because I think we're all guilty of some of those. There is idolatry, sorcery, spiritual sins, worship of false gods and demons. There's uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, drunkenness. I mean, the whole works. These are social sins. This is not a pretty picture. The flesh <laughs> ruins us sexually. The flesh ruins us spiritually. And the flesh ruins us socially. But most of all, it makes us unfit for the kingdom of God. Look at verse 20, the rest of verse 21. <coughs> a 21. Is it on there? Okay. What 21 says is, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do, do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What in the world is he talking about? Take that list. 
Has there ever been any hatred in your heart? Have you ever had any outburst of wrath? Have you ever had any selfish ambitions? Have you ever had any envy? Have you ever had any drunkenness? How about uncleanness? Idolatry? You say, well, really? Let me tell you. It's just talking about sin. And that's the works of the flesh. He says, if you can't, if you have that in you, you can't be in the kingdom of God. Because that means, what does that mean? It means on your own, you cannot make it to heaven. You can't make it to the kingdom. You can't make it to be with Christ forever and ever because you have those things of the flesh abiding in you and with you. You see, God has built a wall around His kingdom excluding certain people. He excludes those people that have not been changed by the power of His Holy Spirit. Do you know why? Because if God allows such terrorists in His kingdom, it would destroy them. You know, this would be a good thing to have him in these people in his kingdom. But if you claim to have accepted Christ as your Savior, your life should demonstrate a real change. And if it hadn't, maybe you need to examine your heart and your life, your relationship with him. Today, stop depending on your own willpower and start depending on the Lord. For when you and your own self ever try to better ourselves, we only make ourselves worse because the flesh knows no law. On the other hand, the Spirit needs no law. The Holy Spirit of God does not require restrictions and rules and regulations. Look at verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against, there is no law. You, there's no law that's going to cause you to have love. There's no law that's going to cause you to have peace and faithfulness and gentleness. No law that's going to do that. Only the Spirit of God can help cause you to have that. And that's the case. Wouldn't you like to have these qualities in your life? Love. That self-giving, self-sacrificing kind of love. That joy of holy optimism, even in the midst of uncertain times. How about peace and inner harmony, a peace that passes all understanding? How about patience? Really, long suffering. It's when you don't retaliate even under, uh, even under extreme provocation. And then there's kindness and goodness, and this is more than just morality. Kindness and goodness means uh, a moral person could evict a widow for not paying her rent, but a kind and good person would pay the rent for her. And finally, there's faithfulness or reliability, gentleness, and that strength under control, and self-control, mastering over your own passions. Wouldn't you like to have these qualities in your life today? Then stop trying to make them on your own and let the Holy Spirit help you. Do you notice that the, it's called the fruit of the Spirit and not the work of the Spirit? You know, these qualities are not something you work to produce. Um, these qualities are produced in you as a result of the Spirit's life through, flowing through you. It's like an apple on a tree. It's growing. What the apple, how much work does the apple do to grow? It does nothing. It just, it, it, it just absorbs the life or the sap of the tree and it becomes this beautiful, red, delicious piece of fruit. And so when you let the Holy Spirit live His life through you, you begin to exhibit the beautiful fruit of the Spirit. God's love, love along with His joy and His peace can capture your heart and change you. It's not something that you work towards. It's something that you get when you walk and you live in the Spirit. Stop mad trying to manufacture all this stuff. Today I'm going to work to be more loving. No, stop working. Let God, it, let God work through you. Let God act through you. Live through you. Don't depend on the flesh for yourself, heaven. And then the third 
thing we find here is walk with the Spirit. Keep in step with what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Imitate His way and enjoy the death of the, of the flesh in your life. Galatians 24, 24 says, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's crucified. You see, every believer has already crucified his or her sinful nature. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you, your sinful nature was dead. You say, Brother Randy, it feels very, very much alive. So when did it die? Well, it died when Christ died on the cross. Galatians 2.20, it tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. And Romans 6 tells us, we know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. That old sinful nature, with its sinful passions and its sinful desires and its habits, it is dead. If you have accepted Christ into your heart and your life, you are a believer, a child of God. You received a new spirit, a new life. You've been born again, and you do not have to worry about that old sinful nature anymore. It is dead. You don't have any more power over us. Quit catering to it then. Don't give in to his desires. There was a lady in the deep south. Married her childhood sweetheart. They had a good life together and, and then she was, he was suddenly taken by a heart attack. She couldn't part with him. She decided to have him embalmed, put in a chair, uh, <laughs> put in a chair, sealed up in a glass case, and placed inside the front door of their large home. There he sat day after day as she acknowledged his presence with a smile in a friendly way. A year or so later, she fell in love with a man and a whirlwind romance. They got married, honeymooned all over Europe. She said nothing about old John there in her house. <laughs> Finally, they traveled back to the States and they were, wind, they were taking the winding road back to her farm. And he started making some plans. You know what I'm going to do? I, I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to pick her up and I'm going to carry her through the threshold into her our new home. We're going to spend years and years together. So they arrived and picked her up, bumped open the door with his help, walked in and almost dropped her on the floor. <coughs> Who is this? Well, that's John. He was my he was my old man in Crummy. He goes, he is history. He's dead. That new husband dug a big hole, and buried her old man in it, case and all. Now this describes the way a lot of believers treat their old sinful nature. They put it in a case, greet it every morning, cater to it to the day, the rest of the days of their lives. They live as if that old sinful nature is still alive, even though it's dead. Please don't do that. We have a new husband who's walked us across the threshold and has awakened us to a new life, a new love. We have a new relationship and an entirely different future. So cater to him. Not, this, not your old flesh. Seek to please him by keeping in step with his spirit. In Galatians 5.25 it says this, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I don't know how many of y'all have ever marched in a marching band. Anybody in here done that? I did that with junior high. I was no good at it. I played clarinet. And, we, and you know what I found? What I found about that was it was rather simple. I just do everything the person in front of me did. 
I walked in their steps. And it worked out all right. If I did my own thing, everyone knew it. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> in the same way, the Holy Spirit walks us through life and all we have to do is keep in step with Him. We don't have to make up our own fancy steps. We just need to put one step in front of the other as the Spirit shows us how. We may have questions about where our life is going to be and where He's leading us and what's going to happen and all that, but you know what? It doesn't matter. We put our trust in Him that He'll lead us in the path that He needs, that He wants us to walk in. Don't cater to the flesh anymore. It's dead. Don't cater to its passions. And don't cater to its pride. And we need to walk in the Spirit. Walk alongside with Christ. Verse 26 is our last verse in the morning. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. You might say, well, how does this work? I mean, this, this verse doesn't seem to fit. Oh, yes, it does. It's... You know what? This comes from the pride of self-effort. That is the pride of the flesh, which leads to provocation and envy. And when we see in our own strength and we accomplish anything, and we begin to think, I'm pretty good, I can do this and I can do that, and we think this, we start looking at others. Oh, they don't do that nearly as well as I do. I'm better than they are. And then, we, and, then other, and then we look at others and they say, man, I'd like to be as good as they are. And the envy's in the strife. And, and that's because we're looking at things through the Spirit and through the law. We're looking at things through flesh. And we're saying, this is what I desire. If I work a little bit harder, I can be this person. If I'm just glad I'm not this person, they just need to start working more. And the whole thing is this. It's not about working. It's about letting the Spirit of God work through you and make you into who He wants you to be. Not about the working. If you want to win the battle against your compulsion to sin, you're going to live by the Spirit, you're going to be led by the Spirit, and walk by the Spirit and enjoy the death of the flesh and the work of the Spirit of God. I'll give you one last illustration. You know, Paul gives a lot of illustrations here. I try to give you illustrations so that you understand more fully that we have to have God. We can't do this on our own. Think of your relationship with Christ like a balloon. There are two ways to keep a balloon afloat. Okay? If you fill a balloon with your breath, okay? The only way that you're going to be able to keep it afloat, to keep it going, is to do what? Keep hitting it. And we've all done that, haven't we? You take a balloon and you're just trying to keep it in the air, and you're constantly smacking it, and it just, but it just keeps coming back down. And that's how religion keeps you motivated. It repeatedly hits you. Stop doing this. Get busy with that. This is my life as a pastor. <laughs> People come on Sunday so I can smack them about something to try to keep them afloat, keep them going, keep them full of spirit. You know, and I, that's what I'm supposed to do. And every week, and, you know, be more generous. Stop sinning. Stop doing this. And every week I smack them back into spiritual order. No, no wonder people don't want to be around me. They get tired of being smacked. But there's another way to keep a balloon afloat. There is. Anybody know what that other way is? How do you keep a balloon afloat? Another way to do it. Helium? Helium. Not your breath, but helium. And helium will make it float, float, float. You better have a string on it. It's going to float away, right? It requires no smacking. It doesn't require anybody coming in and saying, you got to do this and you got to do that. Keeping and keep trying to keep you spiritually afloat. And that's what happens when you allow God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. You soar with no smacking required. It is Him 
that is filling you and you're not trying to fill yourself, it is that big of a difference. This morning, you may think that you're a spirit-filled person and you're living and you've got God into your, your, into your heart of your life. You've been born again and, you're, and, and you know where you're going to go and all that, but you are living your life trying to make yourself holy, trying to live by the rules and trying to blow your own balloon and think you're going to be kept afloat, spiritually speaking. It doesn't work that way.
with you to guide you through life. If you're here today and you've got that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but you haven't been living your life like it, may I make a suggestion to you? Quit trying. Quit, up, quit trying to do better. And let God do it. And let God work better through you. And see the change that He can make. So as we sing right now, let God change you, mold you, the way that He wants you to be. And may you respond the way He needs you to respond. Number five, morning.